hired, fired, and wired. This is the bizarre story of how the Velvet Underground met pop artist and cultural icon Andy Warhol and went on to transform rock music. Welcome to another episode of Poetic Wax, where we dive into the stories behind the records that have shaped music history. Records that you'll find in the collection I've been building since the 1990s. I'm Andy Fenstermaker, and today we are dropping the needle on a pivotal moment in rock history, a band that I've heard at least one music historian dub the first true alt-rock band. To set the scene, we must travel back to New York City in 1965. The art scene is exploding, and underground music is pushing boundaries like never before. A chance encounter at Greenwich Village Cafe set the stage for one of the most influential collaborations in rock history. Chapter 1, The Café Bazaar. Our story begins at Café Bazaar, a dimly lit bohemian hangout in the heart of Greenwich Village. It's December of 1965, and the Velvet Underground have just scored a regular gig at this eclectic venue. Exposed brick walls adorned with abstract art, mismatched furniture, and a tiny stage barely big enough to fit Lou Reed's amp. Here's a quote from a book called The Downtown Pop Underground. In late 1965, the Velvet Underground began performing at Cafe Bazaar, which had fake cobwebs, candles, and waitresses in fishnet stockings who looked like Morticia from the Adams Family. Apparently, the three of them have some kind of Adams Family deal going on. The Velvet's dissonant droning and sordid tales clashed with the Greenwich Village folk crowd's more conventional tastes. The band, consisting of Lou Reed, John Cale, Sterling Morrison, and originally Angus McLeese, had been making waves in the underground scene with their unconventional sound. But it was at Cafe Bazaar where their fortunes would change dramatically. By the time they landed the residency, McLeese had been replaced with Mo Tucker. The residency was, to put it mildly, a bit tumultuous. The Velvet Underground's raw experimental sound often clashed with the expectations of the cafe's patrons and management. One night they'd be the talk of the village, the next they'd get fired. And then rehired. And maybe fired again. One night at the Cafe Bazaar, we played the Black Angel's death song. And the owner came up to us and said, If you play that song one more time, you're fired. The Velvets began their next set with a ferocious version of the Black Angels' death song, and they were promptly fired. What a legend. So Lou Reed stares the manager down when the band steps back up to perform their next set, and immediately launches back into the very same song and kicks it up a notch with an even bigger sneer, as fate would have it. This was the precise night that a new patron was visiting Café Bazaar. Before we continue, want to know what would make me sneer? You haven't liked this video or subscribed to this channel yet, so you should do that now. Have you done it? Alright, good. Let's get back to the story. Chapter 2. When Warhol Met the Velvet Underground Earlier that evening, in late December of 1965, Andy Warhol, already a somewhat famous figure in the New York art scene, walked into Café Bazaar with his entourage. Among them was filmmaker Barbara Rubin, who had heard whispers about this provocative new band and told Andy he should check them out. This is from The Music Settlement. Andy Warhol had been looking for a rock band to manage, and when he first saw the Velvet Underground, it fired his imagination. John Cale's droning viola betrayed his classical music training with John Cage and Lamont Young. Mo Tucker's primordial drumming and androgynous vibe defined the group's feel. Sterling Morrison's primitive guitar stylings and facility on bass and keyboards fleshed out the sound of the Velvet Underground, but it was vocalist and songwriter Lou Reed who attracted Warhol instantly with his streetwise sneer, odes to casual drug use, heroin, I'm waiting for the man, sacrificial death, the Black Angel's death song, sadomasochism, Venus and Furs, and his boyish downtown charm, paired with nonchalant attitude that the two shared. Impressed by their audacity and unique sound, Warhol approached the band after their impromptu final performance. He saw in them the musical embodiment of his artistic vision, abrasive, challenging, unapologetic, and 
entirely new. The Velvets, for their part, were energized by Warhol's interest and support. The Velvet Underground bid farewell to Café Bazaar for the last time. But this ending was just the beginning. With Andy Warhol now in their corner, they were about to embark on a journey that would revolutionize both music and art. Chapter 3. Andy Warhol bankrolls the Velvet Underground. Impressed with their music and, honestly, their attitude, Warhol offered to manage the band. They would ultimately move to a new residency. Warhol installed the Velvet Underground as the house band at his studio, The Factory, in Chelsea, where the raw sound became the soundtrack to Warhol's experimental films and happenings. Here's a quote from Drew Buffalini. The Factory was Warhol's studio, but so much more. It was a hotbed of artistic experimentation, 60s pop stars, vamping models waiting to be discovered, weird poets trapped in the moment, sex shows, including homosexuals, illegal in those days, all of them enjoying the best drugs 1960s Manhattan had to offer. Patrons ranged from Hollywood stars like Edie Sidgwick and Marilyn Monroe and wealthy New York society to people living on the street. When he discovered the Velvets, Warhol was already recognized as one of the fathers of pop art and the godfather of any avant-garde New Yorker with an original artistic bone in their bodies. So Warhol's influence extended beyond mere patronage. He introduced the band to German singer Nico, whose haunting vocals would become an integral part of their debut album right here, The Velvet Underground and Nico, released in March 1967. My copy right here is a 1968 pressing, and here's what makes this special. The sleeve is famed for its original art by Andy Warhol himself, the classic pop art banana, but on early pressings, the yellow banana was actually a sticker. Peel it back and it revealed a pink banana. This copy has a fully intact banana peel, which is not really that easy to find. This record, with its iconic Warhol-designed banana cover, may not have topped charts at the time, but its impact on music cannot be overstated. From the pulsing I'm waiting for the man to the delicate Sunday morning to one of Warhol and, honestly, my personal favorites, All Tomorrow's Parties. This album pushed music in ways few dared to before, and honestly, in some cases after. The legendary legacy of The Velvet Underground and Nico. Whether you like it or not, you cannot deny the influence of The Velvet Underground and Nico on music. Rolling Stone and Spin placed it on their list of the most influential albums of all time. Brian Eno famously said that the first Velvet Underground album only sold 10,000 copies, but everyone who bought it formed a band. And the band's legacy extends far beyond this single album. Their unflinching exploration of taboo subjects, their fusion of art rock with avant-garde sensibilities, and their disregard for commercial appeal paved the way for countless artists to come. You can hear echoes of the Velvets in the glam rock of David Bowie, the punk revolution of the mid-70s, and even the alternative and indie scenes of the 80s and 90s. And their influence on culture extends beyond music, too. The Velvet Underground embodied a spirit of artistic freedom and experimentation that continues to inspire creativeness across mediums. They showed that art could be dangerous, provocative, and still profoundly beautiful. As we lower the needle and those first notes of Sunday morning fill the room, we're not just listening to a piece of music history. We're experiencing a moment when art, music, and culture collided to create something revolutionary. Their records aren't just a great addition to any collection. They're portals to a time when a chance meeting in a small cafe changed the entire course of music history. I mentioned David Bowie. Maybe you've heard his song Andy Warhol. What did the artist think of that song the first time he heard it? I've got a story for you, and you Definitely want to dig into that one next. New episodes of the Poetic Wax podcast drop every single Sunday right here on YouTube or on your favorite podcast platform like Spotify every Monday. And you'll also find the transcript on my Substack every single Tuesday. So like, subscribe, share, and all those other good things. Once again, I'm your host, Andy, and I'll see you in the next episode.